Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness? BetterHelp will assess your counseling needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist so you can get the support you need online in under 24 hours. And Anxiety Slayer listeners can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash Slayer. Welcome back to Anxiety Slayer. Welcome, Ananga. Hey, Shen. This week, we're going to be talking about two key elements to self care that can help us when we're struggling with anxiety or with our health. It's good to be with you having this conversation because we've had so many reach out to us recently about amped up anxiety, about concern for their health with everything that's happening around the world with COVID-19, it's, you know, this is still a conversation we're having. This is still something that we're in. And I think these, this perfect self-care blend that we're going to share today will be quite useful. Yeah, I hope so. What we're sharing today, something that helped me when I was living with long-term chronic illness and pain. And that's that we have to make a conscious effort to keep our spirits up. We need to practice focusing on the area where we can have influence, the area where we do have choice when everything's going crazy outside of us and around us and it comes in on us, but we have to shore up inside and and do what we can to help ourselves feel positive and remain in gratitude, remain hopeful. And it's not easy. It's work, but it's good work. And um, though I learned that from chronic illness, it also helps with anxiety too. When the mind's hijacked by anxious thoughts, it becomes exhausted. And when it becomes exhausted, it needs support. It needs help to steady out so that we can direct our mind and use it well again and experience more peace again. I've found that it's incredibly helpful to have a practice. I know that you have a Japa practice and Mm -hmm. and I I also have a practice uh, where I may or may not be using mala beads, but I will have a something that I repeat, whether it be a prayer, whether it be an affirmation. Right now, the language is all of life comes to me with ease, joy, and glory, which is something that I've learned from excess consciousness. And it's a way to keep my spirits up if I am feeling challenged. There's been a lot going on in our family over the last few months uh, with our aging parents. And there have been days uh, that coupled with what's happening in the world and my affinity toward getting a little flipped out around health anxiety issues and just all of it, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So by, by that repetition of prayer or repetition of affirmation, I've just found so much, so much beauty there. Incredible support there. Yeah, it's it's a really good practice for the mind. You know, you mentioned that my practice is japa meditation, and that's also called mantra meditation. Mm-hmm. And mantra is that beautiful Sanskrit word, but born of two root words. Man comes from manas, which means the mind, and tra means to transcend, to go beyond. So mantra means to go beyond your mind. And in my experience, that's a very good place to be. Beyond my mind is a great place to be. If I'm in my mind, then that's just, you know, a crazy ride. And sometimes a very scary ride or a very low, a low mood that can come into our mind. So, yeah, we, we have to take action to look after our mind and to have these practices that, that can help us when we're in the eye of the storm, find that peace. When I was living with chronic pain and fatigue for many years, sometimes bedridden, usually housebound, I learned that the mind can hold us in a state of helplessness or frustration because the body's forced to rest by by pain and loss of strength. The body's inert. It has to rest, but the mind's still active. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest lesson and challenge for me, and it took me a while to be able to um, 
really get to grips with that. And even then you have good days and bad days and, you know, days when I felt like I was doing well with it and days where I was just down and out. So it's always ebbing and flowing and we need to be able to make peace with that too. Sometimes when we're in pain and we're not well, it might look like our body's resting, but the wheels are spinning in our mind. We're thinking of the things that we should be doing, we could be doing, the things we want to do, and that's exhausting, <laughs> further exhaustion. Yeah, it sure is. And and the inertia of illness and the exhaustion of anxiety can both hold us in that stuck state that we were talking about in last week's podcast. Yeah. And really do a number on us. The mind held in inertia develops a strong negative bias, which constantly reminds us of what we don't have, what we can't do, where we can't go, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And it really brings you down. Yeah. And it's relentless. It's the most awful, relentless experience. And, you know, here in the UK, we're, we're now in, in a lockdown situation again. So over Christmas and New Year, the minds of many are just being drawn to where you can't go, what you can't do, mm -hmm. who you can't see. And it's true. That's a fact of the situation, but it's not the whole story. And when that's where we're focused, we suffer more. We're amplifying our, our own suffering, though it's understandable and it's natural and it's certainly very easy for the mind to go there. But if we can practice drawing our mind back to what can I do? Who can I connect with? You know, we talked about this last week, how you and I can't be together face to face. And the one time we tried it in 10 years, <laughs> <laughs> the virus put paid to that and you had to cancel your trip to the UK. But still, we have this connection through talking over Skype or Zoom or however we're choosing to meet, that we have this relationship where we spend quality time together. And we just had a really good talk and a laugh before recording the podcast today. So to try and draw our mind to how can I connect? What can I do? On uh, Christmas Day here in the UK, for the first time ever, I wasn't with my family. I'm 54 years old. First time I haven't been with my parents at Christmas. And also uh, my other side of the family, extended family, normally I see both at Christmas. And it just wasn't possible. So my daughter and I had to decide, what can we do? What are we going to do? We had a really sweet, gentle day, restful day, lots of reading, a nice lunch together. And in the evening, we had a video call with our family, which was quite rubbish connection-wise because we had family members in Canada and elsewhere in the UK and lots of us on the call. So it was quite funny because it was quite pixelated, but we got to see each other. But you did it. We got to laugh and see each other's faces. Yeah. And the poor connection kind of added humor to it. It was really quite <laughs> funny. There was going to be no meaningful conversation, but it was very yeah. funny. And I went to bed happy I'd seen everyone, happy I'd seen everyone's yeah. faces. So when we can come back to, okay, we can't do this, but we can do that. You know, option B, option C, what can we do? That's where we can unstick the mind. It's going to throw up the negative bias. It does it very, very well. But the teaching of Ayurveda is that the intelligence sits above the mind and the intelligence is like a mother. So we pull the mind back. Okay, we can't do that. And it's understandable that we feel sad or frustrated. Whatever we're feeling about that is understandable. But what can we do? So to draw the mind back, where can right. we connect? Sure. And, and to make sure that we're focusing on improving the quality of our lives and the quality of our overall well-being. Mm -hmm to stay in that space of utilizing the tools and practices that we know work, that, that help us steady our minds, that remind us to fill ourselves with inspiration, to replace the anxious thoughts, the negative thoughts with hopeful and uplifting thoughts. And to, to be in that space of you just do the best you can. And if you continue to remember that you're doing the very best you can in the situation that, that you're dealt, the hand that you're dealt right now is what it is. How are you going to make the best of that? Yeah, definitely. And um, the teachings of Dr. Edith Eager, author of The Choice, amazing psychologist, really speak to that where she always teaches, don't ask why me, ask what now? Yeah, I love that. As you just said, it, it is what it is. So what now? What's the best we can do with that? And I always like on difficult days when I go to bed at night to just say, you know, 
I did this. I made a healthy meal. I did some laundry. Yeah. <laughs> I did some work for Anxiety Slayer. I did my meditation. I went for what, what did I do that when I go to bed at night, it's like I did the best I could. Mm-hmm. And there will be days when it's very minimal what we can do. We might just have taken a shower and put on clean clothes and curled up with a book. If that's the best we can do, that's the best we can do. It's good enough. It's good enough. If we can make peace with that and not be kicking ourselves for the things we feel we should have done, as Tony Robbins said, don't shoot all over yourself because then we suffer so much more. And there are two essentials for good self-care. One is inspiration, uh, wherever we personally find it. Inspiration nourishes our minds, engages us in a much more peaceful way of thinking. And so we're inspired by, I know you and I share the inspiration of beautiful music, of a lovely book to read, conversation with our daughters, conversation with each other, the walks that we take uh, in our neighborhoods and, and around and about and how getting out in that fresh air and paying attention to the trees and the, and the birds and you know, all of that, uh, that, that is nourishing. But also couple that with practical techniques to help calm anxiety and to increase our personal sense of well-being, whether that be breathing practices, EFT tapping, more work with Ayurveda, listening to guided meditations, whatever it is that you do, this all counts. This all helps. It's a combination of inspiration and technique. Mm -hmm. Find the tools that help you feel calm. Yeah. And we need both. Yeah, we do. We need the tools that can help us feel calm to steady the mind. We have to harness our mind. I'm sure I've shared it on the podcast before, but that wisdom teaching from a wonderful Swami called Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And he says that when we get up in the morning, we should beat our mind a hundred times with our shoe. <laughs> <laughs> the teaching is that we have to actively subdue our mind. Otherwise, when the mind's driving, it's like a toddler in the front seat of the car. It's so dangerous and so chaotic for us. It's just not balanced. You know, that is a teaching I needed to hear today because I did not beat my mind with the shoe <laughs> enough this morning, as evidenced by my very, very overly pitta behavior with you before the podcast today, and you know, that we could laugh at. But truly, it's such a good teaching to remember that the mind is not in the driver's seat as much as we often think that it is. No, and it will tell us it is. Mm-hmm, of course. And we need to come back and say, no, no, you're, you're in the back seat. <laughs> and the mind's a tool, but a tool has to be used properly. Right. A knife can be useful. A knife can be deadly and injurious. Sure. How are we using it? So the mind, we have to harness the mind. That's the teaching of Vedic wisdom. That's the teaching of Ayurveda is that a mind left alone, tends to be our worst enemy. I know my mind has to be used. Yeah. Otherwise, it just starts creating its own narrative and its own world, <laughs> its own worldview. Yeah, very destructive. Very. The, here comes the wrecking ball through your mind, right? Absolutely. And it can be so awful to live with. Yeah. So we have to tame it. We have to work with it. We have to harness it. We have to subdue it. Whatever it takes, we need to know that that's the apparatus that all our thinking is going through, but it is not in control. It's a tool. In Ayurveda, the mind is actually a sense. We've got the five senses that we commonly know, but the mind is considered a sixth sense. And it's described that it is thought only. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot more control than we might think over what thoughts are running through the mind. So really, that's the theme of this episode is to have the techniques that can help steady it and support it so we feel less anxious, less freaked out, less scared, and to feed the mind with inspiration. Um, that's like feeding our body good, healthy, clean, organic food. Mm. We need to do the same for our mind. If we're feeding our mind junk food, we're going to get mental indigestion and we're going to suffer more. And after the break, we'll be exploring the art of wise in action, in self-care, and looking at inspiration and practical techniques in even more detail. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
Are stress and anxiety interfering with your happiness and preventing you from living your best life? This year, I worked with a therapist at BetterHelp to manage my anxiety around my daughter moving out in the middle of the pandemic. What a relief it was to have someone kind and objective in my corner. And she was also a mom, so that was helpful. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. BetterHelp's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's a professional counseling session done securely online, and their service is available for clients all over the world. You get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home. It's more affordable than traditional in-person counseling, and financial aid is available. There's a special offer for Anxiety Slayer listeners. You get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. Let's dig into the practical techniques that we were leading into before the break for self-care and calm. When it comes to techniques to help steady the mind, guided meditation is really helpful. And the reason for that is that the mind can have trouble settling itself or we can struggle to gain hold of the mind to settle it. And guided meditation leads the mind into a place of relaxation. So you have somebody speaking to you and and guiding you through a practice or a journey that can help lead you into a more peaceful state. And then you have music accompanying that, which hopefully helps relax the mind as well. So it engages the mind, the senses and the mind are are engaged, which is much easier than just trying to stop dead and think that you're going to have some peace and stop thinking. That's practically impossible to do. So guided meditation can be really, really helpful. And there are different kinds of guided meditations. And on our Patreon, we offer several. We recorded together eight albums of guided meditations, which are also available on iTunes or Apple Music, as it's now called. But they're all there on Patreon. Some are guided breathing practices, some are guided yogic practices, and some are guided journeys, which you beautifully created and led, Shanway. You know, you could just get taken to a beautiful other place. And I think when we're feeling exhausted and ill and anxious, for me, those are the ones to go to where in your mind you can go somewhere bright and calm and safe with a good guide. And it's a very helpful practice. It's also really helpful for falling asleep. Yeah. At least that's what I've found. I, I listen to guided meditations a lot and enjoy them so very much. They're just a, a wonderful tool to have in my toolkit, whether no matter what's going on, I don't even really have to be suffering with anxiety. I can just be maybe having trouble sleeping or just needing to stop my mind, my monkey mind from doing what it does sometimes. Yeah. Think, thinking I have to do a million things when really what I really need to do is to be still. The second area or technique is mindful movement. And this is yoga or qigong or mindful walking. And I have a yoga practice and a qigong practice. We also both do mindful walking. I haven't been out as much in the last couple of weeks because of the snow here and I'm missing it, uh, getting out. And so I need to just bundle up and, and do it. I find that uh, it takes me a little while to get used to the winter weather and and doing such. But the thing is, is even if you bundle up and you're out for 10 minutes, it's it means something. It's It's wonderful for your body, mind, spirit. And the key to these practices is making them as immersive as possible so that our senses are involved. So when we're out doing that walk, we can feel the cool air on our face. We can hear our feet crunching the snow or the leaves. We can listen to the birds. And, and with yoga, when you settle in for shavasana, just being mindful of how the, how the air in the room feels on your skin and the sounds that you're hearing around you. And, and then, of course, focusing on your breath as you move into your practice. And qigong is just... I'm still learning, of course, all of these things, but Qigong is such a lovely way to 
brings so much peace into your body, into your movement, the flow of it. Mm. I have a real simple practice, and I, I know you have a practice that you know that you enjoy as well. This combination of guided meditation and mindful movement is so incredibly powerful. Yeah, it really is. I think uh, Qigong is beautiful for health anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, working in a very similar way to EFT tapping. And yeah, walking when it's cold, we have to get a bit more prepped. Here I'm having to put on extra layers and uh, gloves and a hat. You know, in the summer you can just march outside in whatever you're wearing and it's fine. <laughs> but uh, in the winter it requires a bit more, a bit more prep. Um, my daughter and I tend to walk in the evenings. Last night we missed the light. We will again. Today I'm just looking outside and already it's getting dark. But we went in the evening time. We walked in the dark. And, and then, so then we'll just do it a different way. What, what can you really notice when it's already dark? So last night we saw a little egret. We could just see his silhouette. And we were so happy to see him on the, on the edge of the river. It was such a nice thing to spot. And then we went um, to walk across the park near where we live. And there were big puddles, so I got the torch out on my phone because I'm a terror for falling down a hole in the dark. I'm really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I have my torch on my phone on the ground, and then I was just looking at the, the reflection in the grass, and, you know, it started off trying to be careful. And then we walked across to this little tree that we love in the park. It's called a home oak, and the leaves almost look like an olive tree. I'm really fascinated by this little oak. So we shone our torch up through the tree and we were just looking at the contrast of light and dark and the leaves from underneath and just seeing him in different light was really interesting. And we went and visited another tree and had a look at the torch. (laughs) You guys are so funny. (laughs) But the thing is, is this is inspiration. This is what inspires you. Yeah, because I get really curious. And the thing is, for those that don't know my backstory, I couldn't go out for years. When I eventually could go out, I was on a mobility scooter and I was very good at running that into puddles and holes and getting stuck as well because I just wanted to go everywhere. And they're not so great for getting around. So now, to me, walking is a blessing and always will be. I didn't think I'd be on my feet again, ever. So yeah, I'll go with the torch, I'll go in the dark and I'm looking at trees and I'm looking at birds because it's a whole new gift to me. Yeah. And Then that's why I started taking pictures and sharing with my phone, just snapping wherever I am. But I started taking pictures when I was going through a really sad and traumatic time, really difficult time. But I was on my feet, for which I was so grateful, and I could get out in nature. So then I started taking photos of the things I love to see, and I'd come home and put them in my journal for that deeper emotion. And that helped me so much, just noticing in detail. And I learned new things that about nature that I didn't know before and new ways to observe nature. And I think I got a little bit better at taking photos just because I love being able to get out and observe so much. So what, whatever nourishes us, whatever inspires us, we need to actively pursue it. Yeah. Take the time to make a list of what inspires you and start acting on it for sure. Another technique is absolutely the importance of creative expression in your life. Mm -hmm. And having a a creative daily practice means everything for all of us to, even if it's a few minutes a day that we have this expressive practice. And according to Ayurveda, the body and mind type most likely to suffer with anxiety is vata. You've heard us say this again and again and again, but vata type people are naturally creative. So immersion in creative activities comes very natural to them and is incredibly helpful when they're feeling vata deranged, when their mind is just really needing to be grounded. And we can practice all of these activities very mindfully and with a clear understanding that each one is an antidote to anxiety. The mind becomes engaged rather than being left unattended to create all of those anxious thoughts and narratives. We highly recommend that you make creativity a daily practice. Whether you're doing what Ananga did, walking and and moving while taking photos, or maybe you want to work with clay or you're doing some baking. Later on this evening, I'm going to be 
making some wonderful lemon cream napoleons with phyllo dough and berries, and I'm really looking forward to it. A daily practice, meditation, contemplation, nourishment, movement, fresh air, all of this is what makes a joyful life. All of this is bringing vibrance to your life. And when you stitch them together, wow, talk about something to be thankful for when you, when you rest your head at night, that you could do even one of these things. But to have that creative practice is just so incredibly important. Yeah. So it can be really helpful to make a list of what inspires us or what we feel creatively inspired by, spiritually inspired by. Make a list. What catches your mind's attention? with curiosity and good thoughts. And you can hear from me talking. I get really curious when I'm out and about, but it's very good for me. It's really benefited me and I lock into it very quickly now. So what gets you curious? What would you like to learn more about? What do you already know how to do creatively that you feel you'd like to do more of? And I think it's very easy for us to say, but I don't have time. But if we can just set time, skip a TV show, skip some scrolling, make time, even if it's just 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Because honestly, it's not the truth. That's something that your mind is creating. Again, that's a, that's a story. <laughs> I don't have time. <laughs> so I'm just going to call BS on that and say, you do have time and you owe it to yourself to do it. And it, it's incredibly life-changing. It's another whack with the shoe. Yeah. Another whack with the shoe. <laughs> let's, uh, before we wrap today, Ananga, let's talk about the art of wise inaction. I have a quote here from an author that I really love. She's called Toni Bernhardt, and she wrote a book called How to Be Sick. Also, um, a woman living with prolonged chronic illness. And um, I was reading her when I was really down and out with my health. This is a passage from her book, How to Be Sick. Since becoming sick, I've learned how crucial yet difficult it is to practice wise inaction. The challenge is to avoid actions that exacerbate my symptoms because worsening symptoms give rise to both physical and mental suffering, sometimes so severe that I break down in sobs of despair. Wise inaction is something that she helped me learn. And sometimes I call it giving yourself permission, permission to rest, permission to do the things we need to do on those very difficult days when we are best served by not taking action, not taking big actions. Um, when we just need to say, okay, today I need to do this. I need to do this self-care practice or to weave self-care into every day as we've already discussed. But to be able to discriminate between wise inaction and habitual inaction that doesn't serve us well, in Ayurveda, there's a teaching that what causes us most suffering and what most negatively impacts our health is something called pragya aparad. And that translates to a mistake of the intellect. It's a mistake where we go against ourselves, where we know, actually, this doesn't serve me so well, but I'm doing it. And it's so easy for us now with things like scrolling. Scrolling is not wise in action. And when we finish scrolling, and we, I think we all have spells of doing it, it's something I'm really working on myself. It's so easy to just start scrolling through Instagram or somewhere that you find inspiring, and then you think, hey, I've been on here a bit too long. I've gone down the rabbit hole. Yeah. It's a Pragya Aparad. The way we know it's not wise in action is how do we feel when we stop doing it? And when we spend a lot of time on screens, when we're looking to TV, when we're flicking on and off the news, when we're doing that terrible, so easy cycle where you can go from Facebook to Instagram, to, to the news, to somewhere else, to the email and back again, that's a mistake against our own intellect. The mind is attracted to those activities. Distractions. Distractions, yeah. Pulls us into them. But how do we feel when we stop doing them. So that's when we know we haven't practiced wise in action. All that incoming information makes us more anxious and it makes the mind more exhausted. 
So we know when we've practiced wise inaction, because those are the days when we say, okay, I'm struggling. I'm going to take a nice shower. I'm going to use some essential oils. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to have a healthy breakfast. A gentle, low-key day of of self-care is wise in action. Or when we're really down and out to say, I give myself permission to rest. I'm choosing not to act for my greater good. And I'm going to pass the time in a peaceful way that's restful. Yeah. And it is a choice. I love that you bring that forward because, because we do deserve to choose, to make a choice, to not just fall into what's easier for us to fall into the distraction. And I realize that in some cases, that's all you want to do is keep your mind busy with something other than reality, but the choice that you make. And each time you make that choice, it becomes easier and easier for you to do. And so we invite you to give it a try and to think about what it is you're choosing and to know that it's okay to make a different choice and to not beat yourself up about the scrolling as much as to say, you know what, enough of that. I'm going to go for that walk. I'm going to move my body. I'm going to listen to the meditation. I'm going to read something uplifting. I'm going to reach out to a friend and on and on the story goes. Yeah, and I think it can really help. We tend to have our phone by our side. I find it really helpful to have a little gathering of inspirational items by my side. So I'll have my meditation beads. I'll have an inspirational book. I'll have a notepad and a pencil. Mm -hmm. I'll keep things by me that feel inspiring and and try and remember to turn to those. Because it goes both ways. As you said, Shan, you know, the more we do those inspiring things, the easier it is. And the more we don't, the easier that is. You know, the more we scroll, the easier it is to go to scrolling, to go to social media, to flick on the TV. But the more we do the other things, the easier it is to do those. But we need to have them with us. I have a little MP3 player from when I was sick that I just filled with beautiful music and stories, audio books, inspirational, spiritual lectures. I call it my nectar nugget. (laughs) It's this tiny little MP3 player and it's full of nectar. It's full of good, good listening. And that's by me wherever I go. It was, it was by me in a hospital. I would tell my daughter when she came to visit in the evenings, plug me in. Yeah. You know, plug me in, press play and leave me. I couldn't do it for myself, but she kindly did it for me every night. And I just mm. wanted that good stuff in my ears. Yeah. So gather the good stuff. Be a nectar collector. A nectar collector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, Thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. We're so grateful that you listen into Anxiety Slayer. And before we go, we'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who supported the podcast on Patreon this month and to our new patrons, Michelle and Renee and Steve. We appreciate you. If you found this episode supportive, we hope you'll consider becoming a patron. We have over 70 Anxiety Slayer downloads available on Patreon including the guided relaxations we were talking about earlier, along with tapping sessions and extra resources for calming anxiety. You can learn more at patreon.com forward slash anxiety slayer. Thanks for listening.